Linda Fox. I'm senior reporter with Focuswire, and I am delighted to be here with Airbnb Policy and Communications Chief Chris Lehane. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Linda, a real honor and pleasure. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, always appreciate the work that Focuswire does, certainly amongst the most sophisticated reporting you know, in this space in the larger sector. So excited for this conversation. Oh, thanks. That's kind of you. So I just want to jump in, uh, jump in there with something newsy, which is that you just wrote a letter um, to European regulations, and it you know talks about um, the EU wide approach to short term rentals. Is that generally the Airbnb policy to kind of get ahead of legislation, but sort of before it happens? Yeah, I mean, look, we certainly believe as a organizing principle for our work that we have a responsibility uh, to work collaboratively with regulators, um, you know, we certainly are going to advocate for what we believe are, are genuinely good public policies, but, but ultimately we do believe that uh, platforms like ours do need to be regulated and work within a regulatory framework that helps assure it's working you know, as well as possible for all the various stakeholders that are impacted. And you know, this work just didn't begin, um, obviously, as you know, with the letter to the for sure. you know, we, yeah, we began this really back in 2015. And you know, just to put some, you know, some, some points around that, you know, in 2015, we introduced something called the Airbnb Policy Compact. And I started laughing. I go back and look at it, it now. I, I do think it was maybe a little bit ahead of its time for, for how tech Probably changed about. quite a bit, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it made three basic commitments, right? Um, one commitment was to collecting and remitting taxes, which in many parts of the world, not necessarily in Europe, although France has a version of this, you know, is a transient occupancy tax, a tourist tax. You guys have covered a lot of this. The second, mm -hmm. the second commitment was to uh, share data so governments and regulators could get a sense of, you know, what the platform was, what it wasn't. Um, and then the third was to uh, come up with tools and solutions that really met the needs of a particular city. And really at that time, you know, a lot of our business was in big urban markets. I'm sure we'll get into this. That's really evolved a lot since 2015. Yeah. But that was certainly the case at the time. And you know, at that point, we really did not have a single short-term regul regulatory, short-term rental regulatory framework really anywhere in the world. And you know, you flash forward to where we sit today, and you know, now then more than a thousand uh, 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 communities around the world have frameworks in place that basically track to the original compact. Um, if you look at our top 200 markets from a revenue perspective, 80% uh, of those markets have a regulatory framework in place. And at least to the best of our accounting, uh, today we're the single biggest collector and remitter of those transient occupancy taxes, those tourist taxes. Um, and I think what we communicated to the EU um, uh, last week was really a desire to see uh, the EU take an EU-wide approach. Is, to, is, that, is yeah. that possible? I I'm not sure, you know, knowing the kind of EU as, as I do, it, yeah. is it, would, do you think it's possible? I think, I, think, I think certainly it is possible, and I would um, humbly submit it would be really helpful to all the stakeholders involved. But, but we should be clear, because I think, you know, what, you're, what I surmise you're getting at, but certainly don't want to be presumptuous, mm -hmm. Is that you know by definition, housing um, you know is really typically a local issue um, with different cities, big, small, rural areas, all tending to have different types of issues, right? And yeah. housing is typically a derivative of a local economy, a local culture, a local history. A bunch of issues come into it. Um, For sure. And and I think that's I, I, again not trying to put words in your mouth. I, I do think that's a hundred percent right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you could see an EU framework. Uh, that creates basically a structure or sort of a box or set of parameters that you know everyone could work within and then provide the flexibility for those different communities to be able to work with them. And right now the challenge is that you literally have laws that are coming in, in our intention with one another, if not an outright conflict between you know the EU trying to create you know a one marketplace um, and then these different cities taking their approaches and then even above that, the countries. Um, and so you can end up in situations where a city is taking one position, the country is taking another position, right. and the EU right. is not consistent yeah. with that. So, yeah. um, so all, and I do think there are a set of principles that 
would make a lot of sense to be able to create that framework. And I'm happy to walk through them, but 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 let me pause there. But but just going back to something you said before about something about about, about a thousand you know different short term rental frameworks is is that a good thing? Oh yeah, I mean I think that early on we made um, you know this was a little bit of a of, of a I guess you could call it a bet, but you know our hypothesis in 2015 was that uh, regulations would provide certainty to host. Um, visibility to communities, um, the ability to effectively regulate so that their local laws were being enforced and people felt comfortable about what was going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this was certainly at the time, and again, I'm you know, uh, trying to be humble a little bit, but I do think it was a little bit of a different uh, theory of the case than a lot of other tech companies or tech platforms back in 2015. I think things have evolved sure. since then. But, but our, our bet, uh, or at least hypothesis was that you know, bringing that visibility, bringing that certainty, giving that knowledge would ultimately um, create an environment where you could have sustained long-term growth in a way that was compatible with what a community was looking for. And that's what, what has happened. Um, you know, you look at the places where we've put those frameworks, um, they grow, you know, at the same pace, if not bigger than, um, you know, the overall company, um, at least pre-pandemic. You know, as the pandemic has happened, we've just become so much more redistributed that it's almost like a different, um, different environment or different ecology in terms of where you know where our business is taking place today. But but certainly, our theory of the case has proven um, certainly for us has proven out. And and I would like to think, um, uh, you know, this is one of these examples where, you know, doing right uh, turned out to be good for for everyone. It turned out to be good for us. It turned out to be good for our host. It turned out to be good for the communities. Um, and uh, and ultimately, um, I think has has worked well for all the folks who are involved. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, why frankly I was really attracted to come and work at Airbnb in 2015 was because the three founders, led by Brian Chesky, our CEO, really were committed to that. Um, now they certainly needed help getting there. Um, uh, uh, they didn't come out of politics or government, but sure. they but they were committed to doing that. And I think, you know, in so doing, have helped create a model that others have looked to. So I don't want to just talk about Europe, but yeah. I do just want to ask you about briefly about the consultation um, framework in the sense that, you know, you, presumably there's some stuff that you would like to see in there that you'll want to kind of contribute to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we've asked and have been asking for uh, this consultation going back to 2019, um, I mean, even verbally before that, but I think our first official or formal request would have been in, in 2019. And, you know, what we've consistently identified is it's sort of a set of principles that we think should should guide us. So you're going to have, mm-hmm. you know, the Digital Services Act is going to take place. And then within that, we would like to see, you know, specific uh, uh, regulations on, on short-term rentals. But, but you know, those that framework should be holistic, meaning it's taking into account that these are multi-sided platforms with a bunch of different constituents or stakeholders coming in who all deserve to have a, a voice. Um, it should uh, it should synthesize the various or harmonize, I guess is the more appropriate word, the various different laws and regs that come into conflict and tension right now, so that everyone's able to navigate and know effectively what what the rules of the road are. It should be proportionate. Uh, the vast majority of the people on Airbnb are doing it with one listing, making 9,600 US dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Um, these are everyday folks. You know, we would call them micro entrepreneurs or micro business people or small business people. How do you make sure you're really taking into account, you know, that these aren't folks with you know legions of lawyers and accountants? You know, they're jumping on a platform so they can make this extra income. And I think the last piece is to really be forward looking. Uh, travel has changed. We're out there over the last couple of days talking about the fact that there is a revolution going on in terms of travel patterns out there. And, you know, nowhere is this more evident than in Europe where the entire, you know, a big chunk of the platform has really migrated from these very traditional tourist destinations and urban markets out into non-urban and rural. I think we presume when cross-border travel returns that some of that waterline will shift back a little bit, but it has fundamentally changed. Um, and that change will be durable and going forward. And so how, how do we make sure that you know, the regulations are taking into account what this current new world 
looks like. I, I also do need to really compliment the EU for even thinking about this. You know, I'm sitting here in San Francisco today. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the U.S. You know, every day about what needs to be done. You know, I'm quote unquote big tech. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in meetings where people say, you know, we need to have a 20, 21st century economic regulatory framework. And we're now 21, year, 21 years into the 20th century. Yeah, I was going to say, we've talked about <laughs> right, having right. a framework and it never quite like, happens, does it? So. You can't wait to the 22nd century for this to happen, yeah. right? Um, and I think, you know, Europe, to its, um, to its enormous credit, is really trying to think about this in, that, in, in a big way, but how do we actually put in place a framework that actually reflects the role that tech platforms are playing in society, in, the con in their economies, and doing so from a perspective of you have the U.S. economy, you obviously have the Chinese economy. You know, can the EU really place itself um, at a comparable level, and how can this potential regulations legislation help empower that? But generally, do you think the kind of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces need? Uh, you know, closer scrutiny, regulation, perhaps even standards? I think that uh, that certainly you need some form of a, of a regulatory framework for people mm -hmm. to operate within. That said, and, and this is also why I, you know, I am giving great credit, at least thus far, to how the, the EU is thinking about it. It needs to take into account that you ultimately do need new rules for a new thing. Um, you still need rules. Uh, one of my favorite analogies, and you may have heard me use this in the past, but you know when the automobile first came on, um, I think it was France actually you know had a law or regulation. It may have been the UK or England, but but there was a European country that basically required you know a, a car um, had to have two people, um, three people actually, a driver, a passenger, and someone walking in front of the car. The car couldn't pass a horse, um, and you know you then look at sort of what happened with the automobile industry. Um, in Europe and then compared to how it really took off in, in the US. Um, now you also didn't want a car that could drive 120 miles an hour with, you know, without stoplights and stop signs and exits and you know what sure. is appropriate, but you needed something that was different than, than, than the horse and buggy. And you know, that's the similar position that we are in today. You just have technology moving at a, you know, at an accelerated pace. I mean, the old joke had been you know, a couple of years ago that we were supposed to get, you know, we thought we were getting flying cars and instead we got, um, uh, you know, tweets. Uh, but but I do think that that acceleration is actually really beginning to hit today. And you know, one of the things I always like to tell regulators is, you know, if you think that, um, you know, Airbnb or platforms like ours, you know, are, are a challenge, wait until you see what is really coming behind us. Um, you know, we do want to work with you to figure this out, but the stuff that's coming behind us is going to move so much faster and so much quicker yeah. and yeah. even more complex. So we do need to start to figure this out. I mean, I, I do fundamentally think we do need uh, a new way to, to, to engage. And one of the things that I'll just point to that, that we have done, but I also believe is potentially instructive to this broader conversation is about a year ago, we announced something called the city portal. And the city portal was in simplistic terms was Airbnb effectively creating an API so that cities or governments at national level could directly engage with Airbnb in terms of its regulatory enforcement and compliance mm -hmm. through the platform, right? So mm -hmm. an example, if a city is requiring a license, you would sign up on Airbnb, the city would then process you, determine whether you are eligible for a license or not, and then would effectively not allow you to show up on the platform until they had conferred that license. But as opposed to someone having to go down to city hall half a dozen times, get all sorts of documents. It's all done through the platform. Right. And I do think as we think about, you know, there's been conversations about, you know, does there effectively need to be a fourth branch of government? Does there need to be a utility type of relationship? Mm -hmm. uh, the way we think about it is, uh, you know, there's effectively um, a community sector where community peer-to-peer -peer platforms can intersect and engage, you know, directly with governments uh, to be able to, help make sure that those peers who are engaging are empowered and able to do what they want to do and able to become, in our case, entrepreneurs and make money and participate in this economy. Uh, but and seeing, do they do they engage in that sort of community sense and, and, and get ahead of the regulation they need to be ahead of? Yeah, I mean, the, the city portal has, you know, has, has worked great. I mean, we had effectively done one-off versions of this, principally in North America, um, yeah. 
where there was a real interest and, and engagement on it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we had a goal of 100 of these city portals. We're ahead of that goal. I think we are actually at 35 in Europe alone with another 25 we're in the midst of conversations on. Um, okay. but, but to your specific point, um, governments like it because they get they they can turn on their you know laptop or computer that they're sitting at, get a real time understanding of what's going on, on the platform, but also the ability to make sure that their laws are enforced and the ability to actually get a bunch of the economic data that's being generated by the platform, so they really understand you know the benefits that that they are receiving. Uh, and so I just point to the city portal because I do think it is an example of how you can sort of build this next almost infrastructure to make sure mm -hmm. that these platforms and democratic governments and societies are working well together. I mean, I guess in terms of governments, they would feel uh, more in control. Let's move on. Um, sure. You've mentioned some of the trends uh, changed by the pandemic and they've been widely publicized uh, by Airbnb and by others. Um, what does that mean for rental regulation? And I guess what I mean here is, is it has it taken the pressure off you know, given that you've always come up for criticism in terms of, you know, moving perhaps long term rental renters out of cities, but it, it, perhaps that pressure is now off a bit. Well, I think um, if you look at the data and you're, you're referring to it in Europe alone, you know, 60 percent of our nights are now in less populated areas. Um, we just released our data ourselves yesterday mm -hmm. that, you know, 50 percent of our global nights are in you know, these non-urban rural areas. And so really the pandemic has accelerated a trend that frankly was taking place pre-pandemic, but now has just sure. exponentially accelerated, which is travel and the Airbnb platform has really uh, just migrated into these non-urban areas. I mean, just to put this in perspective, um, you know, if you and I were talking in 2019, Paris would have been a top five market, right? Rome would have been a top five yeah. our top 10 market, Barcelona. Mm -hmm. you know, today, there's more people in Andalusia, traveling to Andalusia than, than Barcelona, more folks going to Brittany than Paris, more people going to Sicily than Rome. And I just share that because I think it really makes clear um, just how much travel is being distributed or, or maybe the, more, the better word is redistributed. Sure. Um, and to your specific question, what we've experienced thus far is that those um, non-urban markets, those rural areas, and this is particularly the case in Europe, but also here in the U.S., have been parts of the, 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 the world that have really been losing out economically over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and so this influx is creating really interesting economic opportunities for folks, particularly when you start to scrape below the surface. Most of the guests are coming from urban markets they tend to be upper income, you know, upper 50% of the in income bracket mm -hmm. and then staying in with more middle class people. And then the money is getting spent in these rural and non-urban areas, which really reverses a cycle that um, had been taking place, you know, broadly in the economy, you know, for the last generation uh, or so. And so amongst the things that's happened is we've just had a bunch of these places really interested in working with us. And it's funny, you, you asked a really good question. Like I, I was used to, you know, regulators from big cities calling and, you know, uh, really wanting to sit down to figure out you know, regulations to, uh, to to try to limit the amount of short-term rental activity taking place, or at least make sure it wasn't impacting their housing if they thought, thought it was. Now yeah. we're getting calls from people looking to say, how can we get this? We want, we want more of it. This is great for our economy. And yeah. one of my favorite partnerships is we did one with a hundred small villages in France as part of a broader economic recovery program. Uh, that we're engaged with with the French national government, but this was a specific partnership with a hundred of these cities, you know, where we were specifically promoting and pushing travel from urban uh, urban guests uh, out into these smaller villages and towns. Um, you know, we do a, a version of that in Malaga, in Spain, and Galicia. Um, you're just really seeing these smaller places beginning to understand that this is a significant economic opportunity for them and and a desire to work with us. So long-winded way of saying, yeah, I mean, a lot of these places are really interested in this. I still think we're always going to continue uh, to have to work and work closely with. Yeah, I mean, these. it doesn't yeah. completely alleviate the conflict, does it? No, but it, there is a certain, uh, I mean, I do chuckle a little bit um, when you get some of these cities that will call even today 
And you just point at the data, like there's not a lot of travel taking place in their markets right now. And I think if someone objectively took a step back and if they still believe that they're having a housing crisis or a housing challenge, the fact that there is a limited amount of Airbnb activity taking place in those urban markets, I think would suggest that there are other pressures that are potentially impacting uh, their housing. At the end of the day, we want to be part of the solution and certainly not perceived as part of the, the challenge. And we do want to work with these cities to make sure that they're as comfortable with us as possible. Well, Chris, we've, we've come up on our time here, unfortunately, but just very, very briefly, what's, what keeps the head of policy for Airbnb awake at night? Well, I will say that so long as I don't have coffee in the afternoon, I tend to sleep uh, very, very well. Um, I will say that as a global company, uh, sometimes those nights are very short, uh, not because I'm being awakened um, out of concern, but like today, I think I had a 5 a.m. Uh, speech or TED talk I gave in South Africa in Joburg right. for their South African Travel Summit. Uh, so sometimes the nights can be very short when you're a global platform in 220 countries and 100,000 plus cities. But I would say, um, and, and more seriously, that uh, I think there's an understanding that the, that the world is, you know, still in the midst of an incredible challenge and an incredible crisis sure. with, the, with the pandemic. So anyone who is a you know, a card carrying member of the party of humanity, like I assume both of us are and many of the people listening, like, you know, you're really concerned about what's going on uh, in, in the world right now. Absolutely. Um, and, and we all should be. And, you know, I do take some solace that we are a platform that is creating economic opportunity for folks. And at the end of the day, you know, one of the, I think the secondary cascade negatives of the pandemic is there is also an epidemic of loneliness. Yeah. And travel, yeah. you know, this from your report, travel is at the top of what people have missed the most and it's what yeah. people are looking to do. And so at least feeling like you're being able to provide some type of a positive and what otherwise has been just a huge challenge for, for all of us. All right, Chris Lehane, Airbnb, thank you very much for your time. Linda, thank you. As I said at the beginning, really appreciate um, what you guys do at, at, at Focuswire. Um, it really is uh, amongst the smartest reporting out there. You know, when you really get in the industry, you guys get under the hood, ask good questions. I really think about this stuff in a comprehensive way. So always, always enjoy these conversations and look forward to more. Great to talk to you. Thanks again. Okay, okay. bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.